Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Astrid, and I'm an alcoholic. Can you hear me back there? Okay. Happy birthday. That is the biggest birthday party I've ever seen at an AA meeting. Unbelievable. And uh, there's a couple people I want to thank before I start. Um, thanks, Taryn, so much, and Todd, and Michael for picking me up from the airport. Um, he had to blow in the little breathalyzer thing in order to get the car started. That's the way. That's the way we roll here in AA. Woo! I wouldn't have an escort any other way. Unbelievably poignant. It was so great. Yeah. And you know what? It is an honor and it's a pleasure and a privilege to speak for AA. I also want to thank a couple of my friends for coming here. John and Cindy and and Kathy and Catherine and Diana for driving down. I really appreciate it a whole lot. Yeah. And, um, And I'm an alcoholic, a real bottle hiding alcoholic. Uh, garden variety, you know, the physical allergy and the mental obsession. Um, you know, before Alcoholics Anonymous came in, there really weren't enough statistics out there to figure out what was what. We've sort of paved our way in the 76 years a little better, and we have a lot more information than we did uh, back in the day when AA had its pioneering times. And... Um, Apparently, about 6% of the population are alcoholics, and what that means is that we are physically allergic to alcohol. We, we're bodily and we're mentally different from our fellows, and I'm completely bodily and I'm mentally different from my fellows. And um, the delusion that I am like other people has got to be smashed or I'm not going to get any help here. And, you know... There's so much medical and scientific stuff on what makes an alcoholic. Did they find the gene? Did they not find the gene? You know, I don't know that it really matters. I think sometimes it's environmental. You know, I I want in my heart to believe that children and infants are not born alcoholic, that we're born perfect, and maybe through our environment and through a lot of pain and a lot of upset, we seek out pain-relieving medication at an early age, and we find beer and we find liquor, and then very quickly these habits, you know, of drinking and medicating the self-talking mind become so... um so uh, in such a strong pattern that I, I cross over an invisible line and I become an alcoholic. I, I like so many people in this room, did have a difficult childhood. Not all alcoholics had a difficult childhood, but there was a lot of pain and a lot of trauma. My mother is a, a, war, <laughs> a war survivor from Nazi-occupied Germany, and she had to survive, and she had to survive on her ego, and she had to survive with... Um, pulling herself up by her bootstraps and not taking no for an answer and being very stern and strict and diligent and not folding and not showing emotion. And so it was always buck up and don't cry and you're not sick. And there wasn't a lot of nurturing and there wasn't a lot of love and there was a lot of yelling and there was a lot of dysfunction in the house. And my mother somehow grew three perfect alcoholic daughters. All three of her children have the physical allergy and the mental obsession. And um, I'm the only one that's sober right now. The other two are in active alcoholism. And uh, you know what? It's a, it's a really interesting life. It's really an interesting life. And I have searched and searched in my mind of how I got here. And I don't really have the answers. I don't, I think the answer is only in the mind of God. But, you know, basically what happened for me is that alcohol took everything, everything that it can take from you, it took from me. It took my, 
relationships. It took any aspirations of completing college or becoming a wife or staying at a company for years and years and years. I, I couldn't complete things. And when I did, it was by the skin of my teeth. You know, I was always cutting corners and, you know, just, uh, trying to shoot an angle and trying to make ends meet. And I didn't really have, um, any kind of inner strength to follow through with anything. And I didn't know that that was untreated alcoholism. For years and years, I I drank at night and I worked during the day, and then that continued to get worse until at some point in my life I was drunk all the time and I, I went into rehab. And I've been sober. This is my second time. The first time I got sober, I did not do the steps as outlined in the big book. I did not follow direction like I do today in Alcoholics Anonymous. I took this whole thing for granted and I thought that I was physically sober and so that life was going to go on and I was going to be okay. I had no idea how the disease operates. I had no idea that it really is sitting waiting at every woman or man's elbow to resume its destruction and that it does do push-ups in the corner. That it's an ism and that it's not a wasm, that it never goes away, ever, ever, ever. Alcoholism is never behind me. I've never completed this journey. I'm, um, it's a daily reprieve and it's contingent on the maintenance of my spiritual condition. So I had 10 years of very dry sobriety, so dry that I could have spontaneously combusted. And I would go in and out of therapy. I would, get self-help tapes and self-help books, which are, you know, the wrong thing for an alcoholic because the last thing we're trying to do is help self. We're trying to get rid of self. And if you really need help, self-help books and self-help programs don't give you any help at all. I mean, for me, it's a spiritual plan of action. And that was so far out of the realm of possibilities. And You know, I never heard the message of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I think that sometimes in meetings the message is diluted, and so you really have to listen carefully. And I would hear these little cliches like, stick with the winners, and I didn't really know what a winner was because I thought maybe it was a wealthy one or maybe even somebody with a whole lot of time. And I learned now that time doesn't treat this disease Time is time. I'm not saying that it's not beautiful to see that man take 44 years. Believe me, the tears come to my eyes. But I've also seen somebody with 15, 20 years that's so toxic that I wish that they would drink again and hit a new bottom. You know? So I had 10 years of very dry sobriety and... um I was sick all the time. I was mentally ill. Like the book says, I will remain restless and irritable and discontent unless I either drink or have a psychic change. I didn't have a psychic change. I had basically a psycho change. I I continued to get worse in sobriety, you know, and I, I had a child and I was trying to raise her and I you know, put her in a very expensive private school and I'm trying to do this teacher training program and I'm juggling all these balls and I'm trying to buy a house and, you know, I just chasing all those crazy dreams outside that the ego tells me when I get this, 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 and this, I'm going to finally be okay. And every time I achieve one of those things, I achieve it on self-will and I get it back into my clutches and I bring it into my home or into my life and it doesn't do anything. And then my mind says, well, that's not the right thing. Go after this thing and go after that thing. And I'd never treated the disease. And so if you be real alcoholic, it says in the print, the bottle's always going to win. Someday down the line, it's going to be me and it's going to be the bottle and the bottle's going to win. And, and that is what happened. I was dating this guy. He was an acupuncturist. I was a massage therapist and a physical therapist. And we just started to have the craziest fights sober. You know, this is years into sobriety, you know, without any program and, um, therapy and throwing knives and cussing and just crazy, crazy, crazy stuff, you know, and I have a child that's a witness to all of this. And I got into so much pain that I went to therapy one day and I just told the therapist, I said, man, I'm I'm dying inside. I, I hate my life. I just want to drink. I'm not having fun anymore. And she said something like, well, if you equate 
drinking to having fun. I can't stop you. And, you know, it was just sort of like my e-ticket to, okay, that's it. I'm going to have a drink. And I went to the store and I bought myself a bottle of champagne and I brought it home and I drank it. And I remember that first drink was just an amazing experience. It really was because it, for the first time, put the fire out and relieved the alcoholism that had been churning and burning in my mind for 10 years. And I got a tremendous amount of relief from that first drink. The clouds parted and the angels trumpeted and God began to sing and I felt so much better. I also triggered the phenomena of craving. Very, very scary. See, the disease is designed not to see itself, and it's going to tell me anything in order to keep alive. It is an ism, and it wants me to drink. It really wants that, and it doesn't want to kill me. It wants me to slowly marinate. You know, alcoholics don't die fast. We die slow and ugly, hideous, sad deaths where nobody wants to be around us. We don't age gracefully. You know, nobody wants us anymore. Our kids and our families separate themselves from us. We can't keep our jobs. You know, it's a really, really sad, sad, sad disease. It's not a moral issue. It's really a uh, a disease that carries you so in the grips that there's no way out without a without a spiritual plan of action. So I started to drink like an alcoholic would drink and in the beginning it was like maybe oh I'd get buzzed two or three nights a week, you know, and then I'd finish the whole bottle of wine three or four nights a week and then it would go into two bottles of wine and About nine months into the relapse, I was drunk pretty much around the clock. I was drinking sips of stuff in the morning, in the afternoon. I was hiding things in Taco Bell cups. I was putting things in the cupboard. I was chewing a lot of gum. And my daughter was getting really disturbed at this time. She was uh, about 11 years old, and she was just falling apart. She knew she was really, really smart and she knew what was going on and she would just like unravel and she would cry and she would say, why are you drinking? I thought you were never supposed to drink again and now you're smoking cigarettes and you're cussing all the time. And she could see the disease igniting itself, you know, and I was just um in denial and I would get meaner and crueler and, oh, just mind your own business. It's no big deal. You know, don't worry about a thing. Um, but every morning I'd wake up with that incredible fear of, oh my God, this isn't going to end or today I'm going to stop. I swear I'm going to stop. I mean, well, I am going to stop today. I am, but five o'clock rolls around and I change my mind, change my mind every day, every day, the same thing. I'm going to stop today. And then I wake up the and at five o'clock rolls around and I change my mind. And that's the way the disease is. It is cunning and it is baffling. It is a very, 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 very powerful source. So as time goes on, if you be real alcoholic, we're going to start hitting bottoms and then going through tra- trap doors and then hitting bottoms and going through trap doors. And my life just went to hell. At that time, I owned a four-bedroom condo. I had two cars. I had a child in a private school. I had a private practice. I had everything that the outside American dream told you to go for. And on the inside, I was just dying of alcoholism. I was afraid and I was drunk and I would I would bail out on my workload and I would not answer the phone and I would cancel patients and I started to max out credit cards and I started to cash out savings and I started to run amok like alcoholism does and then I started to date some losers and bring them into the house and just the whole gamut of, of untreated alcoholism And it started to get so bad, I just couldn't function anymore. I mean, the plans of suicide were running through my head all the time. You know, I just want to die. I want to kill myself. I don't want to be here anymore. And so at one point, these people from my daughter's school asked if they could take her. Like, they, it was just really obvious to everybody that I was completely jacked up and messed up. You know, and they said, your daughter doesn't seem right. She's weepy. She's crying. She seems a mess. Obviously, you need some help. Why don't you go get some help and we'll take your daughter? And, 
you know, here's my 11 year old kid. And I did, I just like gave my kid away to these nice Christian people. I just packed her up, made the decision. This is the smart thing to do. Get her out of here. You know, I'll get cleaned up someday. And I gave my child away and I maybe saw her four more times after that. I mean, once I had moved her out of the house, now the disease was really on and cracking because I didn't have any more responsibility. I could go into full flight from reality, complete mental defecto, you know, city. So I I gave my child away and, you know, started dating this crazy, crazy loser and I couldn't hold on to my house anymore. So I packed up my house and I got a renter in there and I put everything in storage and I moved in with this guy in his garage and now we're screaming and we're fighting all the time and there's knives and crazy, crazy, craziness going on. And eventually, you know, after a series of rehabs and nothing's working, every time I go spin dry, I just come out again and I drink. Like there's no end in sight. It's not happening for me. I'm not getting this thing. I don't have any willingness on my part to stop. God is not coming in. I'm not hearing the message of AA. I'm I'm hopeless. I'm so hopeless. And I just want to die, but I don't have the guts to blow my brains out. And I eventually just literally move out into the street and start a life of prostitution and Sleeping on the side of the freeway, sleeping under bridges, turning tricks all day, hanging out with the street people, filthy, dirty, and the weeks go into months and the months go into years. Years. I spent three years in the street. I completely disappeared off the face of the earth for three years. My child lived in somebody else's house. My birthdays came and went, Christmas came and went, you know, anniversaries came and went, whatever came and went. Half the time I didn't know what day it was, I didn't know what time it was, I just stayed completely unconscious. I am a real, real alcoholic and it is a devastating weakness and its consequences are so unbelievable just unbelievable. So as time goes on, being out in the street and being wet all the time, you know, I do remember just sort of starting to lose my faculties and and not really being able to remember like how old I am or what year it was. I mean, I remember these moments of clarity that were unclear. How old is my daughter? I wonder if she's okay. And And the pain of it, you know, we're not sociopathic. So the pain of of leaving your child is unbelievable. I mean, my, my, uh, my instinct to be a mother, my instinct to care for my child is there, but alcoholism trumps over any instinct and warps it. It takes it and it runs and it twists it all up. So the alcohol is going to take precedent over anything, even me being a parent, even me being there for my child. And yet deep down in my heart, I I know right from wrong. I can feel that this shouldn't be happening, but I cannot stop it. I cannot stop the drinking. It's it's not being lifted. And I, I just figure, you know, maybe I'm going to catch a drive by bullet or, you know, somebody's going to murder me or I'm going to just sit here and have a slow death. But I I couldn't stop it. And, um, you know, the whole prostitution thing, I I really want to touch on that for a minute because I think there's so many misconceptions. It's not fun. It's something that I did in order to survive, to make to make money, to get more alcohol, to get more drugs, you know, and um, I'm not having fun out there. I'm terrified, you know. I'm really afraid, and I'm putting myself in all kinds of dangerous situations many times a day, and the alcoholism starts to get very hardened. I start to get street, and my body language, and my head starts bobbing, and I can kick your behind all over the place. And the disease really morphs me from the inside out. You can see when it's on and cracking. I mean, it's very loud, and it's demonstrative, and it's attention-getting, and it's demanding, and... It's uh, very uncomfortable, and I think also when I see those expressions in untreated alcoholism, I know that there's a very, very fearful, warped person on the inside. It's just the way alcoholism often manifests itself in order to protect itself. It's the way it builds its brick wall, lots of 
cuss words and edgy stuff and argumentative. You want a piece of me? What's the matter with you? You know, I, um, I just get way up on my ego muscle and I get in all kinds of trouble out there. You know, and I, I've seen some of the worst things there are to see in the streets, um, overdoses and, um, people selling their children, people that are so sick with HIV, just, you know, and, and using and using right until the end, people throwing up blood. I mean, it's a really sad situation out there and street people don't necessarily help each other. I mean, it's real dog eat dog. It's a, such a primal energy out in the street. I'm, I'm there and I'm looking out for me. I'm number one and you're definitely nowhere in the grand scheme of things. I'm always watching out for myself. The love in my heart begins to get shut down and I sort of feel and maneuver through the world with this. I don't even really use any kind of intellect anymore. It's really an animal kind of a thing that, that happens. And, um, perverts and weirdos and you know a couple of stories that I often tell from the podium one of them is that one time there it was uh, February and it pours rain in California in February I mean sometimes it's just the most unbelievable torrential rain like it can sweep cars away like you know you're up to your knees in water and it was pouring 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 rain and I was looking for some kind of refuge and I went into this burnt out house and there's water just pouring through the ceiling pouring all over the place and that smell of the burnt wood and People would hide sort of in the back of the house. There were some parts of the house that were kind of dry-ish, and there were other parts where you could see the sky. And you, you, there's no electricity, so you sort of yell, hello, is anybody there, you know. And it's a little spooky because there's rain, so there's all this other noise and static, and you're not really sure what's there. And I could see this girl way in the back in the corner, this girl laying on this sleeping bag sideways, and she was all loaded on drugs, and she was pregnant, way pregnant, like out to here pregnant, like nine months pregnant. And I just sat there with her, and we just got wasted for like two days, you know. And every now and then she'd like take my hand, and she'd put it on her stomach, and I could feel this child contorting in there and I think man I got to get out of here I can't believe I'm doing this and I would just stay it's because even the even the instinct to care for another the herd instinct to help this woman to call an ambulance to get somebody alcoholism will override that it's so subtly powerful it's more powerful than anything except God and if God's not there or I'm not allowing God in the disease is all always going to win you know and and do i feel badly today about that you know it just i guess the kind of feeling that still goes through my mind is i can't believe how sick this illness can get me it can just block me from anything and everything it really can make me do the most vile things and stay in the most icky situations you know um I started to go in and out of jail and in and out of jail. I've been arrested and I've been in Twin Towers nine times. I've been in for soliciting an officer, loitering with the intent to prostitute, prostitution, drunk in public, you know, drunk in public. I remember one time I got drunk in public and it's like, dude, I live in public. Where, <laughs> where am I supposed to go? You know, drunk in public again you know, under the influence, every kind of misdemeanor, possession of a controlled substance, open container, blah, 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 blah. The police just come around and sweep the streets and take the homeless off the streets, you know, and I'd go into jail and I'd clean up a little bit, but the bridge to safety and back to any kind of normal life to like being a homeowner or a mother was so far removed and getting further and further and further away. It just seemed impossible for me to ever fathom that I'd ever be a productive member of society again or stand at a podium in an AA meeting or see my daughter's eyes again. I mean, it just, it didn't, I couldn't see how. I don't see how. I, I, I'm so, I'm so at the bottom of the bottom of the bottom of the bottom and I'm still not dead. So I meet this guy in the street, this, this trick 
from from India of all places. I mean, people roam the streets in India, and then he finds me roaming the streets in California. I don't quite get. I mean, the whole equation is just bizarre. But anyway, this guy he just turns into like Captain Save a Ho, and he wants to like fix me. <laughs> and I think that he probably needed like an Al-Anon meeting or something like that. But he was sure that. He was going to fix me, and he was going to make me okay, and he started to talk to me, and he started to even nurture me, for lack of a better word. He'd, like, look me, hunt me down in the streets and talk to me, and I would tell him about my daughter, and he'd say, I want to help you. You should go to a rehab. You should get cleaned up. You don't belong out here. And I remember I would just think, there's no way back. I can't. There, I just couldn't. I couldn't even begin. I mean, I'm three years into the streets at this point. And he would visit me every time I'd go into jail. And then one time I just thought, all right, I'll try it. And I, I went into rehab. He paid for the rehab. And it didn't work. I was out of there in 30 days and drunk again. And then the next time I got arrested, I got out of jail. And he put me in another rehab. And he paid for all this guy paid for all of this stuff. I didn't pay for anything. I didn't have a dime. Still wasn't talking to any family members or anything. That one didn't work either. It was... Uh, the third rehab that I was in, I was out in Indio at the ABC Club with uh, Helen and Danny Leahy, and I got sober out there, but it was really painful sobriety. And every time I would think about my daughter, I would just be so devastated. I would just want to die. I mean, it would make me crumble. And, you know, every third weekend or something like that, they'd have, like, family weekend, and I'd call the people that had my kid, and I'd ask them to bring her, and they never would. And I knew something was up. I knew that they had taken my daughter. They had her for three years now. They're not giving her back, and they are not going to let her see me, you know. And I know that that was the case today also so it's very painful to be in that place because I'm thinking what do I even have to get sober for and even that last rehab when I was out in the desert I did relapse one more time there and then somebody handed me these tapes by this guy named Bob Anderson who had 44 years of sobriety in Alcoholics Anonymous and um just blew the top of my head off because I had never heard the AA message before. And, you know, what he said was that the main part of the illness actually centers in the alcoholic's mind rather than her body, and that it is a physical allergy coupled with, coupled with a mental obsession. But once the plug is in the jug and the physical allergy is treated, the mental obsession is still there, and it latches on to anything, any problem, any dialogue, any opinion, any anything, and that the mind doesn't think in a linear way. Like the mind of an alcoholic sober is actually different from the mind of a normie, regular person. And I'd never heard this before, that, that I really am mentally different from my fellows. And so he'd say, well, check your own track record, you know, and if the shoe fits, wear it. So what the demonstration was or the application was that I was taught was start to watch the thoughts that surf the waves of your brain and just see how many negative thoughts to how many positive thoughts you're producing a day. You know, the neuroscientists say there's 46,000 thoughts that surf the waves of our brains in one day. And I started to look and I thought, wow, there's four thoughts going 46,000 times and they're all about me. So I started to self-reflect for the first time in my life. I started to watch the disease and become the watcher. And I could see that no matter what was going on, my mind was always trying to mug me. It was trying to take me out of the game. That it is an ism and it is alive and it is functioning and it needs to be treated. And this thing is not a joke. It is a very big, powerful disease. And this mental obsession goes looping round and round and round and round and round. And I can even be obsessed on something and I can make this decision, man, I'm not going to think about this thing anymore. I'm going to stop right now. And then two seconds later, it's back again. You see, obsession is stronger than self-will. There's no way to stop it. There's no way to stop the mind function of untreated alcoholism. There's three treatments, alcohol, blow your brains out, 
or a spiritual solution. There's no gray area in between. You see, I have to go for God. I don't have a choice. I have to go for the spiritual solution. This isn't a church. It's not a religion. It's an AA meeting. It's Alcoholics Anonymous. It's a spiritual program. It's a God of my own understanding. It's a God that I have to build a relationship with. And it's a God that I have to come to believe that's going to restore me to sanity, sound-mindedness. But if I don't know what is unsound-mindedness and what is sound-mindedness, then I don't know what I'm treating. So what are the characteristics of untreated alcoholism? Well, it's a repetitive mind function, and it loops round and round and round. My mind does not work in a linear way. When I have a problem, I don't think from A to B to C, and then I'm finished with a conclusion, and I put it on the back burner. It just goes round and round and round and round. And I can resurrect the resentments from the past, and I can pull up something from 1982 right here, right now, and I can fire up so fast and so hard and just want to kick their ASSs right now, and they're nowhere near here. <laughs> But my mind will make it blossom and mushroom like a frickin' Chia pet now. So fast. And the, and the fear of the future, it'll do the same thing. I'm gonna be pushing a shopping cart and I'll go, whoa, I was already pushing a shopping cart. What's the big deal? You know, it'll go way into the future. This mosquito bite on the back of my neck is gonna turn into lymphoma. Yup, I think I feel one on the next side. My mind speaks to me with great authority. And if the mental illness aspect of alcoholism isn't treated, I'm going to wind up at the liquor store. I'm going to get really, really thirsty. Everybody in here knows somebody in AA who blew their brains out sober, who shot themselves in the head, who hung themselves. It's so tragic. It's so tragic because the disease needs to be treated. And it needs to be treated right now and it needs to be treated today with years and years of dry sobriety, with years and years of the physical allergy being treated. Alcoholism is not in the liquid. It's not in the bottle. It's in my mind. And then in the book it says selfish and self-centeredness is the root of my trouble. It doesn't say liquor is the root of my trouble. It says that the self, the selfishness and the self-centeredness is the root of my trouble. Well, where is this selfish and self-centeredness? It's in the subconscious mind, not in the conscious mind. You see, I'm the same woman drunk as I am sober, and I am not kidding. Just because I'm not hiding bottles and peeing in my pants doesn't mean that I don't respond to things in the same way. I still look at my mother the same way. I still spend money the same way. I still fold my towels and my T-shirts exactly the same way. I drive the same way. I roll my window down and flip you off the same way. I manage my checkbook the same way. I wash dishes and I wash my hair the same way. I'm attracted to the same guys. I'm the same person unless I have a psychic change. This is not a joke. When I come to an AA meeting and I hear people get up and say, and now I'm sober and everything's great, what happened in between? Because there's a tremendous amount of stuff that needs to be looked at, and there's a whole lot of spiritual principles that need to be applied, and the steps need to be taken as outlined in the big book, and these steps need to be applied and lived to my life, like a ceremony, like something that's going to transform me from the inside out. There's a tremendous amount that needs to be considered in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. This is not a moaning and groaning meeting. AA isn't a place to come and get on a podium and dump all your problems. Call your sponsor. You have three to five minutes to share from the podium and you're going to poop all over the place and then sit down. You brought nothing to the meeting. Brought nothing at all to the meeting. What's happening to meetings in Alcoholics Anonymous today is very tragic to me. It seems like uh, the drama du jour, my bunkie stole my psych meds, my sponsor's doing my girlfriend, blah, 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 blah. And often I leave that meeting feeling sicker than I did when I got there. You know, so it says in the in the 12 and 12, you know, it says that, under the lash of alcoholism, I'm driven to AA, and there I find the fatal nature of my situation. Then and only then do I become as open-minded to the conviction and as willing to listen as the dying can be. So if under the lash of this ism, I come to AA and I find the fatal nature of my situation, what that means for me is that 
the meeting's going to present some information to me about my disease and how to treat it. And then once I'm armed with the facts, I can apply this to my own life, and then I can put the oxygen mask on somebody else. So there's a lot that needs to be considered here. I don't want to be a sheeple. I don't want to be a blind leading the blind. I want to be armed with the facts. This is a deadly disease. People die from it all the time. It's a painful disease. It's a lonely disease. It's a disease of isolation. And it's a disease that's loaded with self. So in the print, when it says that selfish and self-centeredness, we think, is the root of our troubles, it also says, you know, in some of the prayers, you know, God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and to do with me as thou will. It says... Um, it says, uh, we must be rid of this self or it kills us. It's my creator. I'm willing that you should have all of me, good and bad. You know, it says, uh, every day is the day I must carry the vision of God's will for me into all my activities. Well, so how do I recognize what is self and what is not self? You know, and my, my intellect will tell me, well, just give some things to people and give them rides and stuff like that. I'm not a taxi, and I'm not a bank, and I'm not a hotel. I don't give people rides. They don't stay on my couch, and I don't loan them money. That's not what I learned in AA. That's not, for me, what putting the oxygen mask on somebody else is. So if I want to be armed with the facts, I do believe that there's a step zero before we get to step one, and that is how the disease functions. I want to see the ego and the untreated alcoholism and the self part. So Harry Tebow was a, you know, he was a friend of AA's. He was a psychiatrist that was on the board of Alcoholics Anonymous in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. He did a lot of cutting-edge work with alcoholics, and he wrote the Tebow papers. You know, you can go online and you can get them. And the reason why I refer to these is because I don't want to say anything up here that's not AA. I don't bring in outside literature. I don't name other people and other books. There's so much stuff out there. But I stick with Alcoholics Anonymous. And what I was taught to use was the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, the 12 and 12, the Harry Tebow papers, and the Sermon on the Mount by Emmett Fox, which is historical literature that Bill and Bob used before they wrote the big book. So I look at these Harry Tebow papers, and Tebow tells me that I'm grandiose, I'm defiant, I'm impatient, and I'm omnipotent. And it's like, what does that mean? You know, and he says the basic characteristic sober of the alcoholic is that I'm impatient, that I do everything in a hurry, that I need it now, that I, I can't wait for things, that I'm always in a hurry, that, you know, the light is turning right and I'm at a gas station and I'm just going to cut through the gas station. I can't wait for anything. You know, I'm in a line with somebody and I start counting the items in her basket. It's 10 items or less. She has 13 items. I'm just going to pull a gun out and f take her out right there in the meeting, in the, in the, in the store. And I think it, I think I, I could kill you lady. I could kill you. You know, that's not what normal people think like, you know, I'm really mentally different from my fellows. So I want to see what this ego does. Harry Tebow says it's an infantile ego. Well, what's an infantile ego? And then we hear these things like, well, you stopped maturing when you started drinking. Great. You know, I pretty much started drinking at 12. So I'm a 12-year-old in a 52-year-old body. This doesn't maneuver well through society at all. So what that means for me is Harry Tebow used the Freudian phrase, the king and the baby or the queen and the baby. And so inside is this demanding two-year-old. I I want it and I want it now. You better treat me a certain way. I want that thing right now. I'm in a hurry. Come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. And then when I don't get my way, up rises the queen. And off with your head. You can be disposed of. I'm never speaking to you again. And I swing from this infant to this queen, from this infant to this queen, from this infant to this queen. Know nothing about humility. The ego so badly wants to stay alive that even the word humility makes it bristle. It doesn't like it. I do believe that the ego knows that there's a God. It knows that there's a neutralizer. doesn't want to hear it. doesn't want to hear this information. The ego was formed, and it's alive and functioning, and it's been in me for 52 years, driving this car in the driver's seat here, maneuvering through life, and I have to go through a lot of spiritual warfare in order to get 
get humble. It's not an easy road for somebody like me. I am large. I am in charge. And for me to take direction, for me to become a listener, for me to apply a spiritual principle, I don't know why I don't want to do it. The information sounds good. I mean well, but I just can't do well. I cannot without the power of God coming in and without really having an understanding about how this disease operates. So, you know, one of the other characteristics is that I'm grandiose. And, you know, grandiosity, again, it operates below the level of consciousness. My ideas are better than yours and... I either think you're much better than me or you're much worse than me. And I look at you and I think, oh, my God, she's famous or rich or too smart. And I walk the other way and I don't even say hello. And then you, maybe your use of the English language isn't so good or you got a little tooth missing and now you're a loser. And I just, all over the place, my mind tells me from the outside what you are and I separate myself from the entire human race. My ego shuts me off from having an experience with anyone, even right here in Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, this is the last house on the block, and this is my home. This is where I belong. And if my ego rises up, I'll say, but I'm in Danville. I'm not in L.A. I don't know any of these people. We don't roll this way. Yes, we do roll this way. Come on. But my mind will tell me something about the people in this room or the parking lot or something or somebody, and my ego will start to shut me down. And I do belong here, and I belong here because God said I belong here. And I have to keep that at the forefront of my consciousness or I'm going to get swallowed up by this unconquerable ego, Harry Thibault calls it, an unconquerable ego that has an incredible recuperative power, he says. A recuperative power that can be so slapped and beaten and humiliated one minute and two seconds later go, that didn't really hurt that bad. No big deal, you know. And go and do another DUI, you know, two weeks later, you know, or cheat again or steal from your boss again or whatever it is. It speaks to me, and it speaks to me with great authority, and I operate from this place. My ego is not my amigo, and if I don't know what it is, I'm going to be in an awful lot of trouble. And the alcoholic ego is much more powerful and omnipotent than the average person. So I'm, I'm grandiose, and I don't like you, and I don't even know why I don't like you. And when I start to really look at my mind and what it says to me, and then I start to see who you really are through God's eyes, what my mind tells me and what's really going on bear very little resemblance to one another. And I am full flight from reality and a mental defective sober right here. Seven and a half years of sobriety, without the steps in my life, I am the same woman drunk as I am sober, and I'm going to get the same results over and over and over and over again. Sober. I'm going to do the same things I always did. I'm going to look at you the same way. I'm going to respond to situations the same way. And I'm going to get the same stuff over and over and over again. You know, insanity is not... Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting to get different results. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, knowing I'm going to get the same result and I still can't stop it. Because the obsession of the mind is so subtly powerful. So I see my untreated alcoholism. I see this disease. I start to look at it. I start to look at how my mind speaks to me first thing in the morning before I even get out of bed. It's there, waiting, telling me, hey, man. You know, I got something to tell you about your future and about your mom and about your bank account. And the minute I open my eyes, it's on. It's so painful. I want a lobotomy once I start to really look at it. You know, I'd get a brain transplant. I'd switch with somebody. You know, no wonder we go on meds. It's club meds in AA. (laughs) Unbelievable. You know, you go to a doctor and, man, my mind's killing me. Yeah, I got something for you. That's alcoholism. I don't have anything against meds, but I do think the medical community is over-medicating us. We weren't taking all these meds 20 years ago. Some people are definitely chemically imbalanced and they need that. I would never tell someone not to take meds. If they're, if they're bipolar or schizophrenic. 
But I do feel that untreated alcoholism has been overlooked in some areas by the medical community, and they just give us things to calm our nerves. Whereas in the steps, the thing that calms my nerves is a power greater than self. But I have to first recognize what this self is. So when I get up in the morning and I see that my mind is trying to mug me first thing in the morning and that it's relentless and throughout the day it speaks to me with great authority. And no matter what kind of situation comes into my life and presents itself, my mind has a story about it, it has a negative story about it, it has a negative opinion about it, and it destroys it. It destroys anything, anything. Now I've finally seen the second half of step one, that my life is unmanageable sober right here, right now, today, because because it's a mind function that's never going to stop and it's never going to go away. Meds or no meds, marriage or no marriage, a fat body, a skinny body, a big bank account, a small bank account, a fast car, a piece of junk, whatever. There's nothing outside in the third dimensional world that's going to fix this disease. It's an inside job. There's nothing left out there that's going to make me okay. But my mind will tell me when I just get this one more thing, when I just do this one more thing. So the information creates humility for me. When I really, really hear the disease of alcoholism broken down, it scares me in a really healthy way. Because what it does for me is I say to myself for the first time, I am in so much trouble. What am I going to do? And that naturally builds a process right into step two. It just hitches on like a Lego. I come to believe that there's got to be a power greater than self that can restore me to sanity. And sanity in the big book is defined as soundness of mind. And a sound mind person, I am definitely not. So i got to build a relationship with this power. And like I said, it's not a religion. It's not a church. It's an inside job. It's a relationship with a power of my own understanding. I have to build a relationship like I would with anyone. I talk to this power like I would talk to a friend. I offer my life. I offer my will. I offer everything I have to this power in a moment-by-moment basis. And I say things like, power, could you please protect me from my mind? Because my mind's trying to hurt me today. My mind's trying to tell me bad things about my life. And I live in sunny Southern California. And I have a beautiful child. And I have a car. And I have a job. And I have a mattress. And I have a refrigerator with food and hot running water and I have some clothing and I have all the outside things that I could need and my mind's still trying to hijack me. Could you protect me from my mind? You see, I have to get God down into where the disease is, which is in the subconscious mind, way down in the basement where all those phone calls are coming from. The calls are coming from inside the house. I got to get the power way, way down in there. It's a bad movie, and I'm in it. So I asked this power, power, you got to be with me. You got to help me. And because there really is a God, I start to get relief for the first time in my life. I start to get an open mind or the disease gets treated. Some people call it grace, the peace that passes all understanding. I just know everybody in here has had glimpses of that, maybe whole days, maybe whole weeks. I don't know who's treated their disease for long periods of time. Sometimes it happens just miraculously. The ego breaks and humility comes in. And what it feels like to me is that nothing matters out there anymore. I'm taking myself out of the race. I'm not running for office anymore. I'm out of the popularity contest. I stop seeking any approval. It doesn't matter what you think about me, good or bad. I really don't care anymore. And I start to rely on this power. And I start to rely on the peace and the love that this power produces for me. And I ask this God to please intuitively guide me. I can only be intuitively guided through inspiration, in the moment that I'm in. I can't have the disease treated five minutes ago or five minutes from now. It's a right now thing. It's not even a daily reprieve. It's a moment-by-moment reprieve, and it's contingent on the maintenance of my spiritual condition. It's contingent on the maintenance of how connected I am to this power. 
Am I connected to the power or am I not connected to the power? For me, I cannot wake up in the morning and just do a, you know, God, I offer myself to thee, build me to do with me as a will, relieve me of the bondage of self, you know, my creator, I'm not willing that you should have all of me and then go out because there's like 10 more hours in the day where I can just get into a whole bunch of trouble really fast. I got to take this power with me everywhere. I got to take this power. I connect with this power first thing in the morning before I get out of bed. I go to the bathroom with this power. I brush my teeth with this power. I get on the phone and I talk to people with this power. I take the power definitely with me in the car because I can just be a maniac on the road when things aren't going my way. And I start to build a relationship with this power in the moment that I'm in throughout the day. And I start to get relief for the first time in my life. I start to get relief. I start to have these moments in the beginning where it's like, wow, it's really weird. If somebody could take my internal temperature, I don't know why, but nothing's bothering me. And, you know, sometimes there's a bad SHIT storm in my life, and other times there's nothing, you know. But it doesn't really matter. You know, it doesn't matter what's presented on my plate on a daily basis. I'm able to handle situations that used to baffle me, like it says in the book. I'm able to rely on a power greater than any human power. I expect miracles. I expect them because I rely on them. I need this power to manage my life. I can't even tie my shoe without looking down and thinking these are the wrong shoes. I can't even look in the mirror at my own face without seeing something wrong with it. I can't even get in my car without seeing that one scratch on the right-hand side. I can't do anything without this power. And step two, as I build this relationship with this power, I start to live by spiritual principles. I start to apply them to my life. I start to want to apply them to my life. I start to be more and more desperate. I start to yearn for this, that gift of desperation and sobriety. I never want to put those coals out. I burn and I yearn for more. I'm desperate to be with this God, even right here, right now. I'm desperate for more. I'm always seeking. It's in the seeking. It's in the sodding. It's an ongoing thing. And it's not in the finding. The seeking is a huge part of the remedy. In the seeking is where I get the relief. I keep asking and desiring and yearning and wanting this power to be with me. And God changes my perception. And I look at people and their faces are beautiful. And nature starts to speak to me again. And I hear a song and it stirs my heart. And I see somebody that I thought I hated, and I don't know why. I don't feel anything like that. Maybe I just feel neutral. It's gone. God's doing for me what I could never have done for myself. I'm being restored to sanity. I'm being rocketed into a fourth dimension. I'm My thinking is placed on a much higher plane. All of this stuff is in the literature. I wouldn't tell you anything from here that's not in the AA literature. It's the truth, and it's the truth for my life. I'm talking about my life. I'm talking about my life. My life that's been saved from Alcoholics Anonymous, not from a church or a self-help book or a guru or a therapist or a guy from Alcoholics Anonymous. It's a very, very precious program. It's a program that's so near and dear to me. And it's a program that sometimes it, the message doesn't get heard. It gets squashed. It gets abused. It gets pushed aside. People think AA is hokey. AA is for losers. Alcoholics Anonymous is only 76 years old. It hasn't been around very long. We're not even 100 years old. When I see people like that guy with 44 years, that's a miracle. If Alcoholics Anonymous was not here, we would all be in the loony bin somewhere, locked up, hysterectomies, lobotomies, blah, 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 blah. I mean, Alcoholics Anonymous is a real program for people like us, and it is the greatest treatment still to date for somebody with alcoholism. But if I don't know what's wrong with me and I don't know what the solution is, what am I doing here? There's so much to be considered in AA. I've got to roll up my sleeves. As I go into step two and I start to build a relationship with this power, it's much easier for me to go into step three and turn my will and my life over to the power. And basically what that is, it's my thoughts and my actions. I don't lie and cheat and steal today. I don't take anything that is not mine. 
I do not cheat at my work or at anywhere else. I don't look you in the eye and tell you one thing and do another. I try very hard, even on the inside, not to hate, not to character assassinate. That's definitely one of my, you know, bigger defects is that I still want to look at things cockeyed and I want to make you wrong or make you beneath me. But it doesn't feel good anymore. I get a really sick feeling inside from doing that stuff. The reason why I get a sick feeling is because God's the manager of my life today. And God does that for me. God restores me and God shows me what humility feels like. And when self comes back in the picture, it just doesn't feel comfortable at all. I start to really live by intuitive guidance and I start to trust in the unknown. I don't know what the future holds. I don't know where we're going. I don't have a big plan and dreams and schemes anymore. We're going to build a farmhouse, you know. We're going to grow corn. I'm going to get a pickup truck. I don't know what. I don't have any wild, wild dreams of achievement anymore. That's not who I am today. That's an, I just I live moment by moment with this power, and that produces an incredible amount of freedom I fall in love with the unknown. I don't know. I don't need to know. I don't want all the answers anymore. I don't want to figure it out. It hurts me to try to figure it out. I just let go and I let God. That's the proper use of my will is letting go of everything. Absolutely. Because I deal with alcoholism and it is cunning and it is baffling and it is powerful. What that looks like for me is I just say, you know what, God, you take my job, my family, my bank account, my health, my child. You take all that stuff, I'm going to leave it right here on this altar. And I close my eyes a lot of times and I just stand naked in the desert and I just think, you have all my stuff, have everything, and I'm going to stand back here and I'm going to just allow you to be the manager of my life. And I allow God to just reshuffle the deck and I don't know where the chips are going to fall. And I just trust in the process because if I'm orchestrating my life, I'm going to get what I always get. And my past is going to become my future. You know, my daughter's an incredible human being today. She's 22. She just graduated from college. She's in Nepal. She's in Kathmandu. She's working with the poor. We have a very close relationship relationship. My relationship with my family members still isn't so good. You know, I don't speak to my mother. My sisters both have untreated alcoholism. And in my last inventory, this is for me, for my life. The, the realization that I came to is that I'm much better off leaving those guys alone. I've poisoned them enough and they poison me. They're still a trigger for me. And I've just gone the other way. And this year, I'm going to spend my holidays with people that love me in AA. And I've walked away, but not walked away with a middle finger waving. Walked away completely surrendered that I don't need these people to complete me anymore. I don't have to have blood ties to feel okay. I have a God in my life today, a very, 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 very big God that loves me and has a big plan for me. And I don't have to know what that plan is. I just need to rely on this power greater than any human power. It's a pleasure and it's an honor to be here. This is the last house on the block and this is my house. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.